I have to tell you, I'm going to talk about GIS. Well, I was asked to give a little bit of information about who I am. So I am Jan Scarlett. I am an epidemiologist. I was the former director of the shelter medicine program, which I have now handed the reins over to Dr. Berliner, who you may or may not have heard speak earlier. And uh, I did that with great relief, but also great promise on, on her part to do a wonderful job. Uh, I've been in sheltering for a long time now, um, and one of my interests is spay-neuter and the effectiveness of spay-neuter programs. Um, so I'm going to talk today about what we believe is a very promising new quote-unquote, it's actually been around for quite a while, but certainly new to shelter medicine, the use of geographic information systems to help us better target spay-neuter efforts. And I'm going to explain a little bit what GIS is in a minute, so just hang in there with me for uh, a few minutes. I, what I want to do first off, though, is give credit to Dr. Anna Reading. The, what, the bulk of what you're going to see is something that Anna did. She came to me when she was a first year veterinary student, said she was, a, in her former life, a GIS technician, and that she was interested in shelter medicine in homeless animals, and she thought that her skills could be utilized to help us better focus in on where our homeless animals were coming from. And she said, do you think that would work? And could I work with you? And I said, yes, because <laughs> I do not have training in uh, GIS. Uh, of course, Dr. Berliner and I have been supervising Anna or when she was here. She's now doctor reading, and she's graduated and practicing in Arizona. So we lost her and her skills. Uh, and then I also want to thank uh, Jim Boudreau. For those of you who don't know, Jim is the executive director of the Tompkins County Shelter and his staff, because the data that I'm, the most of the data I'm going to show you today are in fact from the Tompkins County Shelter. Uh, incidentally, you are in Tompkins County. So Tompkins County Shelter is the shelter that serves the uh, community in which you are currently sitting. Um, so you all know this. Uh, we have lots of cats in the country. Uh, this most recent AVMA survey suggests somewhere around 74.1 million owned cats. Um, interestingly, and I, and I just highlight this, we don't really know for sure because there are, there's variability in the way that these surveys have been done over time. They've now launched mostly into internet-based surveys, and whether you get the same information from internet-based surveys as from postcard uh, mailed surveys is unclear. It looks like there may have been a decline in cat ownership. That would be consistent, potentially, with the economic downturn that happened between the last two surveys. Um, not clear yet. I, I think we're all kind of waiting to see whether that really bears out to be true. But keep that in mind, because we're going to talk a little bit about some of the issues and problems of evaluating whether or not GIS is actually working. And I think that may play into our, may, may help confound some of our interpretation of the data. Um, the other thing that we have with cats that we don't have with dogs is a large free roaming population, at least here in the United States. And nobody knows for sure how many of these are, there are. The, the estimates that I think that come from the people who are most knowledgeable put it somewhere around 35 to 40 million, half again as many as there are owned cats. We really don't know. There are lots, there are millions of them. I think I, we can say that with 100% surety. Um, and the other thing that I think we have pretty good data on is that the vast majority uh, of these animals are not sterilized. And those of you who work with cats, which is probably all of you, you know what reproductive machines they are. They are very fertile, incredibly able to, um, to reproduce themselves. Um, we have some data about what's happening on uh, intake. I think it really does vary by the region of the country. Interestingly enough, some recent work done in co all of Colorado, uh, almost all of the shelters in Colorado and many of a very large proportion of the animal control delivering shelters in Ohio would suggest that, in, that their intake in cats was increasing. Again, is that a reflection? I mean, it certainly depends on the area of the country and how economically 
hit they were by our, by our recent uh, uh, recession, depression, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so this also may, especially if you're using GIS and then want to see whether it has an effect, if you've got increasing rates of cats coming in because of other factors, you may, it may mask or blunt the effect of your spay neuter, uh, targeted spay neuter efforts if in fact they are really effective. And then of course you all know that we have much higher euthanasia rates across the country in cats than we do in dogs. Um, so effectiveness of our spay neuter programs. In dogs, we have seen oh, for the last three decades, two and a half, three decades, a in most parts of the country, a decline in dog intake. Throughout the country, it, with the exception of probably the southeast. And then even there, more recent data would suggest, at least in some communities, they're seeing a decline in dogs as well. We've been neutering dogs, and not necessarily just through, uh, I mean, predominantly not just through um, our shelter populations and spay-neuter clinics, but rather our veterinarians have been recommending and pushing spay-neuter in dogs for a long time. They've been pushing it for cats. I think people view cats very often differently. Um, although the neuter rates, if you actually look at neuter rates among dogs and cats, the neuter rates in cats owned cats are higher than they are among dogs. So, so in fact, uh, it, it, it strongly suggests that this, this free roaming population that are largely unneutered that really contribute most predominantly to our uh, cats in the shelters. Um, the cat intake, for whatever reason, I think it's the one I just spoke about, but has remained relatively stable and in some communities actually increased. Uh, there are certainly exceptions to that. And I was talking with somebody last night who was telling me about a community in, in Massachusetts where, in fact, they're seeing a, a fairly steep decline in cat intake. So that's a good sign. I'm hoping that they, that is a, for, for, foretells a trend that will be more widely seen throughout the country. Um, there are several studies of, in communities that have had spay-neuter programs. And now I'm talking about not only the veterinarians doing spay-neuter, but also the uh, spay-neuter clinics and the shelters really ratcheting up their efforts to do spay-neuter. It is disappointing, and there aren't very many studies, and these studies aren't necessarily easy to do, so I'll preface my remarks by that, but the studies that are out there either suggest no effect after thousands of surgeries or a very modest effect, much less than what we would like to believe should be, should be happening given the number of animals that are often involved in these spay-neuter programs. I mean, thousands. We're not talking about just 100 animals or 200. We're talking about thousands, in some cases, tens of thousands of animals. Um, so why is that? Why, despite all our efforts and the, the thousands of animals that we've done, why is it that we, can, we can't really demonstrate an effect on intake, or at least a mo or it's a very modest effect on intake. And I, I don't think we know for sure why that's true. I mean, one of the contributing factors is this large free roaming population. And tied to that is our data from, and these are simulation models. So again, simulation models have their place. They are valuable. They are only as good as the data you put into them and the, the assumptions on which they are based. And so the couple of studies that have been done in cats suggest that some, you have to reach somewhere between 75, 80% of the reproducing females in a population before you actually see a decline in the reproduction rate in that population. If we have thousands of free roaming cats, that we, like we think we do in any community, depending on its size, of course, are we truly reaching that population in the, at the level that we need to, to really stop the reproduction going on there? Certainly one of the stronger hypotheses to explain why we aren't seeing an effect. Um, the original TNR programs 
were not just to go out, trap as many cats as possible, come in, bring them in and neuter them. And actually TNR was not necessarily started for cats, but often was done with dogs in countries where, where we do have a lot of free roaming dogs. And the initial theory was that you would combine TNR and the TNR with education, with removal of food sources, so that you kind of discourage them from reproducing and, and going on to keep multiplying. And the other part of it was that you would look at an area that you were going to do your TNR efforts and you would carve out a doable piece and you would go in there and blanket that one area and do you know, 80, 90% of the animals in that area. And then once you had that area pretty much done, you moved to the next area and you went after that area. And then you, and keeping an eye on this area, because you have to go back periodically because you're not going to get every single cat and you, or dog. And you would work your way slowly over time to encompass the whole area that you really wanted to work with. Um, so that's, so we really, and we're, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, that we really haven't uh, complied with that model in may, many or most of our programs. Um, and then, are we really reaching the source? Are we going after, you know, is this, are we getting enough of these free roaming animals? And are we really reaching, even among the owned animals, are we really reaching the people that, who end up surrendering their animals to the shelters? Um, and, then, and then another question is, have we had just not enough time? Have we not been doing the neutering long enough, like with the dogs intensively, uh, now in this large free roaming population to really see an effect. So I don't have the answer to what I think it probably is some of maybe all of these things. I do want to talk a moment about the approach of many of our US spay neuter programs. Um, in most of them, the clients will self identify themselves, if for owned animals at least. And in many cases, even the it's our it's the people or volunteers that are going out to get the stray animals that are self kind of identifying themselves and going out and getting animals and bringing them in. And are these people kind of the low, somebody said to me earlier, you know, the kind of the low hanging fruit. We're going after the low hanging fruit, the ones that are easy. They may have even gotten those animals neutered anyway, or they're not the people who normally come in to surrender animals to shelters. They're the ones that find homes for those kittens or whatever. Um, and uh, perhaps we are just, even though we're doing lots of animals, and we're doing good because I think we, there are two pieces of spay neuter. One is to try to diminish intake into shelters. That's one goal. But the other goal is to provide for a better life for that animal, that is to reduce uh, the risk of mammary tumors, to reduce the risks of having repeated litters, to reduce the uh, hormonal levels that frequently lead to the behaviors that cause relinquishment into shelter. So there's a, there's a, I'm not, please don't go away and think I'm not saying that spay neuter isn't really important and that we're not doing something really positive by spay neuter, but if one of the goals is to diminish intake, maybe we're not doing it in the most efficient way and the way that will most likely lead to declines in intake. Um, and you know, I mean, by, by going and getting just, and letting people self-identify, we aren't going in blanketing this area, getting this area under control, moving on, getting this area under control. Now, why aren't we doing that? Because it's very expensive and labor intensive. And the, many of the models that have been set up to sustain economically our spay neuter programs can't afford to do that, or else they, their fees would be much, much higher and they wouldn't be able to compete. So again, I'm not being highly critical of them. I'm simply saying that they may not be serving the goal of diminishing intake into shelters. Um, so certainly, Thinking about trying to identify who's coming into the shelter and how they might be contributing 
to overpopulation is not new. I mean, people have thought of that before. And, and people have used zip codes. They've gone, gone back to particular homes. And so this, using GIS, I think, is a variation on that. It's a refinement of that approach of saying, well, you know what? We actually know where our animals are coming from. It's very hard to think of a shelter that isn't collecting information, at least from the owner-surrendered animals, about where, their, where those people live. We get their name, their address, their zip code, their phone number. So we have, or should have in most cases, pretty darn good information, at least for owner-surrendered animals. And maybe if we thought more about it, we could get better, and tried harder, we might get better information about where our strays are coming from. So um, if we could have good information to localize where they came from, then we could use this geographic information system approach. So what is it? Um, this comes off of the Esri web website. Esri is a company that has been heavily invested in producing the software. There are, it's not the only one, but it's heavily, it's probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest. Um, and they have a lovely website. I really strongly encourage you to go to their website. Um, and their definition, and I think it's as good as any I've seen, is that it's, uh, the GIS integrates hardware, software, and data for capturing, managing, analyzing, and displaying all forms of geographically referenced or spatial data. Essentially what it does is take data points and now put them on a, a map. I mean, that's the simplest way to describe it. It takes data points and puts them on a map so that you can see them, see the spatial distribution of the data that you're looking at. I'll show you some examples here in a minute, try, hopefully making this a little bit clearer. Um, so the whole notion is, the whole reason to do this is to better understand, to see, better understand, to ask questions about what, why we're seeing particular patterns or relationships such that, and it's all done in the form of maps, globes, reports, charts, et cetera, that help us better get a better handle on what's going on and where are these animals coming from with, the, of course, the whole notion in, in our case, I think, is to now then use that information to um, strategize protocols that will make us more effective in launching, in, our, in the case I'm talking about, spay-neuter programs. But you could think about a lot of different things. Uh, what if it was cruelty? What if you saw spatial um, patterns and clusters of where cruelty came, particular neighborhoods where most of a, a, a high number, a high density of your cruelty cases came from. Think about the potential for education, for intervention there, for early recognition of problems as they begin to um, develop. So I think it's not just spay neuter. I think this has potential for many other applications. Um, and when I want to make a mention here that the people that are really have done the most work with this in sheltering it, are the people from the ASPCA. Anybody from the A here? They probably, oh, yeah, Vert's there, good. Anybody else from the A? Oh, Lyle up there too, good, 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 good. Um, the A really has done, they have a, uh, for those of you who don't know, they, I don't know the formal name, but they have a data gathering and analysis unit that Dr. Emily Weiss, for those of you who have heard her early, or, uh, actually heads up. And uh, they are, have been using GIS for some time. And in fact, I was talking with Emily a little bit. They got a grant from PetSmart to help them hire a couple of GIS technicians. And uh, they have, and here's one of their maps. This is stray intake, and this is an SPCA. This is theirs. I took it off. I stole it off the website. Um, but here, what they're doing, they, they're color coding the density of stray cats coming into, and I don't know if it's one shelter or several shelters in Cleveland uh, that they're studying. It's but the two biggest, it's the private and the 
pri private and the public. Thank you. I meant to ask Emily that and didn't get a chance to do that. Um, so what you can get a sense of is, by gosh, this is where you know, a large number of their animals, their, their animals are coming from. Now, that may also be the largest density of people there, too. So I mean, there, and what's lovely about GIS, and it's used by a lot of urban planners, is that you can superimpose census data. You can superimpose land use data. That is, how is the land being used? Is it residential? Is it uh, trailer parks? Is it blah, blah, blah? You can uh, overlay um, income data. And there's a whole bunch more. I don't even know all of the overlays that you can put on top of it. So you now can associate the density of stray intake or owner surrendered intake with various factors that may well help you, again, design preventive programs. Lots of power in this, I think. Here's, uh, and you can do a lot of things with this. You can present it in many, many ways. Not only now, here what they're showing you is, well, how many owned cats came and how many stray cats came from each of these areas. So they've now not only told you about intake, but they've broken it down by whether they were stray animals or owner surrendered animals. You could do this by age, which I'll show you in a, in a few minutes, which is what, what, which is, is, is what we did. Um, and uh, I, it, it's, an, I think, a potentially extremely powerful tool to, and it's gonna go into the toolbox. I'm not suggesting this is an answer uh, to all our issues or problems or whatever, but it's one more tool, and I think it's a fairly powerful tool. Uh, this, is, this was done, and you can, you can display it in different ways. Uh, and there are various techniques that, that enable you to display this and to learn various things from it. I just wanted to show you some examples. So, so I mean, I think we can think about a lot of things. We could localize sources of intake by age, by potentially bully breeds versus non-bully breeds, uh, origin of cruelty cases. We can overlay that now with all this other information. And I think the other, one of the advantages, especially in larger communities where there are numerous shelters, they can work together to put their data in and to maybe, maybe it'll help build some cohesiveness where they have a common goal. They now have a common map that shows where these animals are coming from because surely there's going to be some overlap. It's, it's a rare city that has a shelter that's serving only this area and there's no overlap with the other, shel with the other shelter or the other. So, so maybe it's a way to kind of build coalitions. I don't know. I, I would like to believe that that was so. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Tompkins County, because the data I want to show you, in fact, come from Tompkins County. So um, for those of you who are not from Tompkins County, we have a population here of about 101,000 people. We're about 475 square miles. And we have a, a, an average annual intake, at least over the study period of 2009 through 2011, of about 1,500 cats. Uh, these cats represent about 73% of the intake, the other part being dogs, and then we have a few of the pocket pets, and every once in a while a pig or a goat or something. Um, and then among the cats, 51% of our cats are kittens. And here we're defining, here we defined kittens as anything six months of age or younger. Um, so just to give you, we, we're very fortunate here at Tompkins County in that they've been collecting intake data for a long time. We've had pet points since I think the late 2008, but in fact we had a FileMaker program and, and so we've got pretty good data on intake. And as you can see, this is very, very typical of many communities in terms of dogs. That our intake has been going down steadily in dogs. Up until maybe about 2009 or so, in fact, it was almost no change whatsoever. Yes, you get the blips, but no trend in cats. What I do want to point out is that this has now dropped even more in 2012. And so we now have some already a, a decline in cats coming in. And I just keep that in mind when we talk about how to evaluate what we're doing now with the, with the GIS. Okay. So, I like to use metrics, and I think one of, this is a form of looking at metrics um, and data with goals in mind. 
I don't want to collect data for its own sake. I don't. I want to use that data, and I want to use it to answer some important question to the shelter. So I think most of us would agree that reducing intake, and especially cat intake, which we're going to focus on here, um, is a goal of most of our shelters. Um, and in 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 Tompkins County, what what we decided is we really would look at kittens. The whole notion being if, if our spay neuter, if we can figure out where our clusters of kitten, if there is clustering, if there are patterns to our kitten intake, if we could identify them and go in and target them, if it was a particular household, if it was a particular um, neighborhood, we could go and we being Jim and his people, I'm using we very loosely here, sorry about that Jim, they could go um, and really even knock on, write a grant and get money to really go in and blanket those areas to, to much greater extent than other areas. Um, and with that data, if we could demonstrate that, we thought, and I think it was borne out, we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, that by having that data, that would enhance the likelihood of getting grants to further the spay and neuter uh, program such that it could actually do that kind. Because it's gonna be more expensive to do targeted kinds of spay and neuter. Because now you've got to identify the clusters, you're gonna do something more intensive in that area. And you, you, can, you can choose a variety of different techniques and we'll talk a little bit about what Tompkins County um, actually did in a minute. Um, so our questions were, was, is there a spatial distribution of entering kittens? Are there patterns in that spatial distribution that might be helpful to us? Um, and you know, can we identify those areas and, and really think about strategies that we can uh, implement? So let's talk a little bit about how, and I'm gonna do this just from a very conceptual standpoint for two reasons. One, it gets a little bit complicated about how to do it. Uh, you, you really do need a GIS technician of some sort. Secondly, Jan doesn't know how to do it, so, uh, <laughs> so that's even a more important reason. But it starts with having good information about location. And because of that, we looked at the data we had for stray cats and said, ooh, we don't have good information from where our strays came from. So the study that we actually did targeted owner surrendered kittens only, okay? That's not necessarily ideal, but it, at this point, with the data that we had, because you want a fairly high proportion of good data, complete and accurate data, in order to be able to do this. Um, and we uh, actually looked at two periods of time. We started out looking at 2007, 8, 9, no, no, it was six, seven, eight, and then said, but that's older data now. We were kind of working out the bugs of doing it. Could we do it? Did we have good enough data? And then went to the more recent data. You want to get as recent data as possible, obviously. Um, and then we looked at all the addresses. They were heavily edited. This takes some time. This is, a this is the tedious part about it, okay? Um, data were what we call geocoded. There's a special feature within the software that enables you to do this. Um, and then this geocoding puts coordinates on each of your addresses so that they can be overlaid on a map and put accurately onto the map. And in our case, we had 93% of the original owner surrendered records that had good, good enough data to be used. So that's pretty high. You're, you're striving to get as high a proportion as possible because otherwise you're, gonna get, you're quite likely to get misleading information. Okay? So here's the distribution of the kittens in Tompkins County. Looking at that, now obviously that some of these little triangles represent more than one kitten. Okay, so looking at that, does there look like there are any patterns? Um, looks like there's maybe more here, but that's Ithaca. That's where, where the people live. We're probably about right here somewhere, down in here. But um, 
So, so we need something else. This is because this is way too many spots. You wouldn't want to try to say, well, I'm going to target all of those. You want to try to begin. And, and so we, what we had to do is really think about, whoops, I guess I think about how could we refine the question. And I think what we were really, really after, as we began to talk about it more, was the repeat offenders. The people that, not, not the person that, oops, my cat got out, I had one litter, I got her in, I got her spayed. We were after locations that year after year contribute kittens. And so, um, so what we did was, um, we made an arbitrary decision. We said we want to look at locations where there were at least 12 kittens that originated from that location within that, that three-year time frame. That's more than one litter. It's probably more than two litters. I mean, yeah, I guess you could have two litters of six, but usually we don't get six kittens in a litter. So it's probably most of these places have at least three litters coming from them within a three-year time frame. So we said, we're going to look for that. So we're going to look for clustering of kittens. If you surrender just one kitten, two kittens, we're not going to target you. We're going to go after the repeat offenders, the ones that keep coming back. And it's not important to understand this, but just to know that there are various ways of identifying these clusters. And then the question is, did they happen by chance? Did, is there a chance occurrence? So it, some of this actually removes chance occurrences as well. Um, so here, what you can see is this sort of, these aren't the clusters, but this sort of tells you these were less than eight, th these areas in white were less than essentially nine kittens. These areas in yellow had somewhere less than uh, greater than nine, but less than 16 kittens. If it's in yellow, it, here they had somewhere less than, um, less than, greater than 15, 16, but less than 30 uh, cats, et cetera. Okay, so you can see that now you begin to see what would be more manageable foci to really target. Okay, and then, and then you can just overlay that political, you can overlay that with roads, you can overlay that with socioeconomic status and all of that stuff, all right? So now, um, what we found using our definition of 12 kittens or more was that we had 16 clusters uh, for about, out of the 996 total kittens that we were able to map, 280 of those kittens were in clusters and 716 were not in clusters. And I just, uh, something that we probably should have recognized early on, one of, these one of these 16 clusters was the Tompkins County SPCA, not because we had kittens being born there, but because kittens were being dropped off there. And so we didn't really fully recognize it right away. So, so we had to pull that out of any further analyses that we did on the data. Okay. Um, and so here are now, if we look at, uh, and you don't, we still have the colors here, but what I really want you to focus on are the circles. So the bigger circles mean that somewhere between 20 and 28 kittens came to the shelter during that three year period. Um, the smaller circle shows somewhere between 16 and 19 kittens came from that shelter, from that location. And then 13 to 15. So now, now we've got some much more manageable foci to work with. And the, the lovely thing, and then you can overlay the, the various towns. We have how many? 14 towns? 16? No, about 15 towns? I don't know, 11? I don't know what it is. Billy, I, Jim, you'd know better than me. I should know. I don't. But one of the things we wanted to look at, because the staff at the shelter said, you know what? We think we get an awful lot of kittens from some of the trailer parks. And we don't know which ones they are necessarily off the top of our head, but we you certainly have that impression. So one of the things we did look at here was land use, and these land use categories are in fact come out of the census. Uh, there are definitions that we didn't establish, but that are by other censuses. And, and we did it 
to get a sense of all of these, but we were particularly interested in the, in the residential park, the trailer parks, because also as we looked at the map, you could tell the, the knowing the, the community, uh, you could look at that, and if you knew where the trailer parks were, a number of those clusters actually over, overlay um, trailer parks. So what we did was, just as a quick first glance, we said, well, let's just look at the total number of kittens versus the clusters and see if we can see any difference here. And you know, lo and behold, one of the most, one of those that stood out the most, the, what we're looking for is the difference here. The difference between, uh, and we should have used, uh, and you'll see in another analysis here, we really wanted to get the unclustered kittens and the clustered kittens, but this, this still tells the story here. That in fact we are, we have a disproportionate number of these clusters coming from, uh, res uh, from residential parks, or that is trailer parks compared to non-trailer parks. And um, the other thing you can do with this, I mean, you, you now can, depending on how finely you want to get to take this down, you can actually, and in some cases we found literally a residence that was contributing kittens year after year. In other cases, it wasn't necessarily the residence, but rather an, an area. But you can use this information, this is just one small part of Ithaca, but showing the distribution in this neighborhood of, of one, two, three, four, six different clusters. Happens to be also a relatively low income area in, in Ithaca. Uh, just another, just to show, just to illustrate here that not all of these necessarily occur in urban areas. This is a, um, you know, a sort of a, this is a, what is it? It's a agricultural area. So this is an agricultural area. Probably, I didn't look it up, but I think it might be a residence there that in, even though they're re relatively rurally located, they are producing uh, more kittens than uh, that fell within our, our definition. And then here's one, and this is just one of the trailer parks, but you can see that very definitely the trailer parks were at uh, in, in the next slide, they were at the highest risk. What I'm doing, what we're doing here is saying, how much higher is the risk that you will have a cluster if you are in a residential park? So if you're in a residential park compared to a low density residential area, you're 16 times more likely to have a cluster of kittens. And, and the rest of it kind of makes sense too. High density residential area, you'd expect with more people, you're more likely to find clusters where there are more kittens coming from that area. Um, I just wanted to point out that if you have data from over time, you could begin, we actually did this as I mentioned earlier from 2006 to 2008. And you can see, not, they don't necessarily, because people move, things change, but there are a number of areas where, in fact, over a six year period, the same, you know, the same thing was happening. So uh, if you happen to be lucky enough to, be, to have the data longer term, and if you start doing it now in your own shelters, you could build a long term map that would help you see what kind of progress you're making and, and, and get a sense of you know, what are perpetual force, force, um, sources of kittens and what are ones that just pop up and then disappear. All right, so the question, the $64,000 question is does it work, right? Does it do a better job? Can we demonstrate a decline? The problem, part of the problem right now is, is that this hasn't been being used very long. So we have, not much data. And I can't really find a published piece of data in shelters yet. That being said, uh, Barbara Carr has two nice examples. I, it, it, Barbara often doesn't, she, I mean, she does these, this, these studies because she wants to work in her own community. She doesn't want to publish it. I always try to publish it, Barbara, because other, other communities could benefit from your experience. Barbara has two examples uh, that she can show you data that certainly strongly suggest that she saw a fairly dramatic effect in just one year in intake from those areas where she did targeted neuter. And then she was, what she was doing was comparing the before 
they did the targeted spay neuter to the after in the same areas. Again, I wish she, that she would publish that. And I'm trying to get Emily to get some of that data. And, and she's got a thousand other publications on her desk as well. But, but the A helped with that, incidentally. The A was involved in doing this, as in Portland. Um, and I don't know if Joyce is Joyce here. She said she was going to pop back and forth. Joyce was talking to me a little bit about what the A had done in Portland. And in Portland, they had uh, three control communities and a targeted community. And she said they, they're not done yet. They haven't quite finished with their assessment there yet. But she said one of the interesting things that they've seen is that all of the areas, the intake in all of the areas have dropped. Control and other. Now, that's one of the problems of doing, you, you say, oh, this must be easy to study. We can, we can just go back and look at the effects. One of the things, Jim, that you know, we've talked about doing is looking at the effect after we have done this targeted effort. The problem is we already have a decline that's due to something, but that was taking place before we started this spay -neuter, targeted spay-neuter. And so how do you distinguish what is happening in the community? And there are lots of factors that could be affecting intake. How do you attribute? that effect to cleanly to, um, to your targeted spay-neuter efforts. Uh, it reminded me when, when um, Joyce was telling me about the Portland experience of something that happened years ago with, um, with an intervention in humans where they, want, they went in, they, they had people that they went and they evaluated their cholesterol levels, their blood pressure, and their smoking habits. Took a bunch of, it got thousands of people. Very expensive, million dollar study to look at if we intervene and really work with people, can we lower heart disease in these people? If we can you know, do them, give them uh, smoking con uh, counseling, if we can lower, counseling them about diet, if we uh, control their blood pressure with medication and what have you. And it was a randomized trial, you know, pinnacle of our clinical trial. Um, you know, scientific evidence gathering uh, uh, protocols in the real world. And then they followed these people for years. Guess what they found? So they had an intervention group and a non-intervention group. Sorry, I missed that part of it. So they had an intervention group and a non-intervention group. Guess what they found? No difference. But they both went down. And the, th the thought was that by one studying them, by bringing them in and doing that, that they changed their behavior, they made them more aware, and secondly, that at the same time over that time frame, there was smoking, smoke, they ra had ratcheted up, not they, the investigators, but society had ratcheted up all the messages about improving your health, doing more exercise, and so, their results, I mean, did, did it mean that their intervention did no good? I think probably it didn't mean that. It probably meant it did do good, but that, you know, that, that other things were happening. And so I think that's something that's going to happen with these, with these uh, trying to evaluate the effectiveness of these. Also, remember that we're getting more and more rescue groups. So they may be siphoning off some of the intake. They may be taking some of the intake from this shelter and now doing here. That's why it would be nice to do it at a community level. It would be nice to get collaboration and do it at the community level. Lynn. One thing we know to start to start is, uh, like in Alabama's big fix with Mary's Fund funding, um, because there's so much advertising and so much going on with the project that it influences other people that have been thinking about getting their animals paid or neutered. Um, and they see this all going on, and so it increases across the board. Yeah. It's not necessarily that it happened before the project started, but it, it's because of the project. Yeah. And I, yeah, I don't think you're ever going to separate that, but it's no. all good. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. It's definitely good. It's just, it's just that people then point, people who are naysayers, point to the study and say, you didn't find an effect. Right. You know? Um, it's and it's, good. yeah, but it's still a good thing. So it, I, just, I just bring that, I, I don't think that's going to happen in every, like I say, Barbara has some pretty convincing data that would suggest that she really could demonstrate an effect. But it's, these things are, I, I just caution you that these things are not easy to study. There's lots of things that can affect um, why 
your intake may be going down. Okay. Yes. Beth. Well, yeah, the problem, you know, from a, just from a study, yes. I mean, the, the problem from a study design standpoint is that you get a small, relatively small sample size. You know, you've got two or three households there. You can demonstrate they aren't contributing, but it's really important to say, has the intake at the shelter gone down, if that's, if that's the goal? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I think that I'm not arguing that it's not doing good. I, uh, and that you can't demonstrate it perhaps in those areas. Yeah, it doesn't mean it hasn't moved to another area. That's right. That's right. Or that two years from now won't be the same in that area. So this is a long-term process. You can't just do this once and then and then not and walk away. You've got to stay on top of it. Okay. So anyway, I just wanted to make the point that we're already going down, and, and this has already gone down. So we'll have to see. I mean, I'd like to see it really go down. We'd have to look at the different rate at which it declines. But whether we'll have enough data to really be able to demonstrate that statistically, I don't know. All right. So um, is this possible in your shelter? Because you say, oh, this is fine and good. This sounds great. But, but I can't do that. We can't do that. And I'd like to suggest to you that in many cases, some of you can do it. And now. Um, what I think the big stumbling block may be is finding this GIS technician. But it's amazing how many people know GIS. Yeah, I was gonna say, so we've got one, we've got one in the community, you know, one right here. I mean, she lives in Pennsylvania, but. <laughs> but, but the point is that um, we, I think you might find it among your volunteer staff. For those of you who are, at, if any of you are at a municipal shelter, Many cities have GIS technicians, not to do this, obviously, but they're working with the city planning and all. And I was talking with a group from Austin, Texas, who said, you know what, we have those people on, on our municipal, they were with the animal control, which was controlled by the city. We could potentially use those people, and it, would save, it might save the city money, because if the intake goes down, then they save money, argue back to the government if we could take some of your time of your GIS technician, and they're very good at this. I mean, they, they, don't, they take less time to do this. Um, then, you know, maybe you could actually save some money, and, you know, money talks. So um, looking for uh, universities often have GI, people who are, are proficient in GIS, uh, city planners. Um, even going in and making a plea to one of the, you know, some of the GIS technicians that your city employs and saying, would you be willing to do this gratis or at some reduced fee? Um, so I think that it's very doable. Now, the thing is, you've got to have good information to give them. So if you're doing a sloppy job at the intake desk of entering that information and you're not doing it completely and accurately, this will not work for you. So it, re it requires good data. Bert? Stan, on that note, uh, um, I think it probably would also spin for doing not a sloppy job. It probably spins for doing a good job. But the, some of the specific things that we run into is there's an address for every animal that comes in, but lo and behold, when you dig into it a little bit, a lot of the strays come in and the address listed is the shelter address, or the address listed is um, where the person lives who brought the animal in, but That's not right. the street address where the animal was picked up. Found. Um, officers often will list a street, but not a street address when they bring the animal in. And so it's, it's that decision in where exactly did this animal come from? Did you lift his feet off the ground? Right. And that's the piece. Right. That's so, and there's no going back and picking that up. No, no, I agree with you. So, so if you have owned animals, you want to be sure that this isn't the son of the mother who lives someplace else. So you want to be sure among owned animals that the animal, that you collect the address where the animal originated. And then for stray animals, um, stray animals, it, it, Bert is absolutely, you need to do exactly what Bert was saying. And they can use coordinated. I mean, so, so at the corner of Blake and White Street, or very close to the corner at Blake and White Street, we found this cat. And so if you can even push people to, to do, and, and have a, you could even have a map 
of your community on the front desk and have people point out because they might not know the names. Oh, I, I know where it is, but I can't remember the name. I'm doing that all the time, even more as I get older. <laughs> well, it's that street that you know goes by the big red building. Um, but they might be able to locate it there. So if you're really serious about doing it, and I really, I really um, think this is going to be a very powerful tool. And so I really encourage you to, to, to think about doing it. So this kind of anticipates a little bit, because um, the A, and please go to this site, uh, the A has put together a number of resources for shelters. And first of all, there's a little quiz. Are you ready for GIS? So you can sit down and, and answer the questions for that. Um, there is a checklist, sort of like, are you ready for, and it's kind of a repeat of this, only a little bit more extensive. And then it actually talks to and gives you very clear information about what information you need to collect. And I said addresses, really to be maximally effective, you want to have source of animal, that is owner surrendered, transfer in, because uh, obviously <laughs> you've got transfers in, you're going to get um, you know, animals from out of, the, out, of the com out of your particular community right there. Uh, age, so that you can get the kitten, puppy, adult animal. Um, you certainly want to, you, you might want to get gender. I mean, the very basic demographic features of these animals, especially those that might play into preventive measures. And there's a, a I haven't gone, I'm, that's not an exhaustive list that I just gave you. It's all in here. And then um, if you're really adverse to doing the reading, there's an online webinar that kind of directs you. And so it's very nice. The A has done a lovely job of putting that information together. So, so in summary, geez, I finished on time. Um, it's, an, it's a, it's a relative, it's a, it, the technology actually has been around a while, but it's new to us, I think, in sheltering. Um, I think it has wonderful potential, even though we don't yet have published results that it's, that it's effective. I think we've got enough anecdotal stories. There'll shortly be some published results out there that Emily's going to put out. Um, it will require time and effort initially to get good data. It's going to require some retraining of people at the intake desk in some shelters. Uh, it's going to require some watching of those people and monitoring and looking at the data. So it's going to be somewhat labor intensive. But think if this really does work, the savings to you in the future as the intake of your animals goes down. Or the, even if your intake remains relatively, you hopefully get a higher proportion of animals coming in pre-neutered. Right? So that saves you money because you don't have to pay to get them neutered. So I think the payoff is really potentially very good. Um, there are resources that I've just directed you to. There are an awful, type in GIS and you get all kinds of resources on it. I, I like the ones on the A because they're targeting spay neuter, or, or I mean, excuse me, shelters. Um, so uh, I just I have to make a plug for our shelter medicine program. We obviously don't do just data and stuff, because that's a minor part of what we do. That's what I do. But um, we also do consulting with shelters and, and welcome any of your questions. So if any of you in the audience ever want help with any problems with the shelter, please contact us. If we, for some reason, cannot help you, we can direct you to who, who can. Um, and this is a little plug for a book we're, gonna, we're working on on shelter metrics, a little self-serving stuff, you know. Um, but I really hope it will be helpful to you guys, that, that it will help you better. And we're going to talk a little bit about GIS. But using metrics to kind of uh, let you know where you are now and whether or not, once you implement preventive measures, that, in fact, you can, um, are you affecting a real difference? Are you doing no harm, one, but secondly, hopefully, you're actually bringing down intake or increasing your spay neuter, whatever it is. So um, that hopefully will be out in 2000. So I, as always, we want to thank the Maddie's Fund who has enabled this program to even exist. Uh, my colleagues, uh, the Tompkins County Shelter, and then Dr. Reading for all her hard work in working on this. So thank you. Questions?